And uh, so I wanted to lay out a couple points as we move forward on this debate, which I fully anticipate we'll get to and we need to as a country, uh, for actually many of the reasons that my colleague from Alabama and others have raised because of these problems that we face with regards to our immigration uh, system here in the country. So let, let's just take a step back and kind of analyze this issue a little bit. For the people that are tuning into it for the first time, maybe you're here visiting Washington and are listening to the talk about it, and, and kind of a fundamental understanding of what we are addressing here. Let, let's begin by saying the obvious, and that is all Americans understand immigration because it's their story. Whether it's you, your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your great-great-grandparents, one of the defining characteristics of the United States of America is that it is literally a collection of people from all over the world, or the descendants of people from all over the world, that have come here in search of a better life. I think it's important to understand why that distinguishes us from the rest of the world. The rest of the world's attitude throughout human history, basically, if you look at the countries that have been organized throughout human history, the nation states, all these countries have largely been organized because people had a you know, common ethnicity or a common race or they came from the same tribe or the same family clan or what have you. The U.S. is very different. The U.S. was actually founded on the notion that what we want is we're going to create a country here that believes fundamentally in the God-given right of every single human being to go as far as their talent will take you, as far as your talent and your work will take you. Now, you may say that, well, you know, people like me that have been born and raised here our entire lives, sometimes we take that for granted. But I want you to understand that throughout all human history, that's a rarity. In fact, throughout human history, what people have been told by their leaders is, you can only go so far in life because that's what your parents did, that's where your family comes from, and so that's all you are allowed to do. But we were different, and thank God we were. What we said is, we don't care how poor you were the day you were born. We don't, it doesn't matter to us that your parents weren't well-connected and well-healed. We don't even care that you were born in another country. If you have a really good idea, you really want to work hard, if you really want to build a better life for yourself, we want you. We want you. And that's been the history of the United States, a collection of go-getters from all over the world who have come here and built this extraordinary country. And the influence that this country's had, not just on human history, but even to modern day, is unbelievable, culturally, uh, economically, in terms of ensuring peace, especially in the aftermath of World War II. All of it is the result of this particular reality about who we are as a people and as a nation. We have always had immigration, and we will always need immigration to keep the nature and the essence of who we are as a people. But times change, and the immigration system has to change with those times. In essence, the immigration system we had 100 years ago, 150 years ago, People forget this. What was the immigration system of the United States not so long ago? Here was the immigration system of the United States. If you got here, you got to stay. If you made that dangerous voyage across the Atlantic, if you found your way to this country, you would be processed at Ellis Island or somewhere else, and you got to stay. We can't afford that anymore. No one's asking for that. We have to have a controlled system of immigration, especially in the 21st century, that measures who's coming, why they're here, who they are. Now, that may not be the way it worked 100 years ago or 80 years ago, but that's the way it has to work now in the 21st century. We understand that. Adding to that, by the way, is the reality that the 21st century is so different from the 20th. We are actively engaged in global competition. Now, it wasn't so long ago, like when my parents came in 1956, the U.S. was still a national economy. The people you traded with and sold with and competed against, they lived in your country, probably in your own state or in your own community. No more. Today, we are actively involved in global competition for business, for clients, and for talent. So we have to understand that our immigration system has to reflect that. The way people immigrate, and who immigrates here now, has to reflect the 21st century reality, which is reason num number one why this country needs immigration reform. All the attention is being paid to illegal immigration. And look, that's a serious problem. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But issue number one. The fundamental reason why we have to do immigration reform is because we do not have a 21st century immigration system. Our immigration system today is largely built on the idea that if you have a relative living here, it's easier for you to come than if you have a special skill or talent that you're offering to the country to contribute. We don't have a merit-based system. We have a family-based system. And I say that as someone whose family came on a family-based system. My parents came here because my mom's sister claimed her in 1956. But the country is so different, the world is so different, so different from 2006, not to mention 1956. And our immigration system has to reflect that. The problem is we have a broken legal immigration system. It does not reflect the realities of the 21st century. And the result is that even if we didn't have a single illegal immigrant in the United States, we should be on the floor of the Senate debating 
immigration reform because we must modernize our legal immigration system. And that, as much as anything else, is a reason why my colleagues should be excited about the opportunity to have this debate. Because we have to modernize our legal immigration system so that it is a, a benefit to our country. And I give this anecdote because I think it's appropriate. You know, we're in the NBA Finals, which, by the way, the Miami Heat won game two in resounding fashion. And um, we're very happy about that. We'll see what happens tonight. But imagine for a second if there was now the high, hottest basketball player in the country played at some college in the United States, six foot ten, never misses a shot, just an unbelievable player. Do you think in your wildest dreams that we would ever let that person go play in Italy or Spain or some other country? There is no way in the world that we are going to allow the best basketball player in the world, no matter where they're born from, no matter where they came from, no matter their immigration status, there is no way in the world that we're going to let a future NBA star leave the United States and go play basketball in some other country, in a European league or the Greek league or whatever. They're going to stay here. And so my question to you is, if that's how we approach sports, which is important, I guess, but it's a game, shouldn't be that, that be the way we approach our economy? Should we be deporting the best graduates at some of our universities, world-class physicists and scientists and people in technology and engineering and math? And yet that's the way, our, functionally, our immigration system works right now. And I'm not making this up. We've heard the testimony. We have heard the people that come into our offices. There isn't a member in this office who hasn't had a meeting in their office or their staff hasn't with someone from the tech community that will come to you and say, we are going to college campuses. We are making job offers to the best and brightest. And we can't keep them here, not because they don't want to stay here, not because they're not qualified, not because we don't have a job opening, but because we can't get them a green card or a legal status. And so they are learning at our universities at the expense of the American taxpayer, and then they are leaving the United States to compete against us. That makes no sense. Nor does, by the way, the system of getting workers for agriculture, which I would argue to many respects is skilled labor. If you don't believe me, go watch some of these people in the field as they work and, and the work that they do. But American agriculture, you, you talk about energy security. Talk, you want to cripple a country, cripple, cripple their food security cripple their agricultural security. Agriculture is an important industry in most of the states in this country, and certainly for the United States of America. That, that industry depends on a workforce. And there is a demand for labor in that workforce. And the fact is, and has been for over 100 years, that the only way to fully fill all the jobs available in agriculture is through seasonal and temporary labor from abroad. There is a real demand for that labor. And there is a real supply of people that want to do that labor. And supply and demand will always meet. But because we do not have a functional legal immigration system that allows the supply of foreign workers to meet the demand of domestic jobs and agriculture, supply and demand are meeting, but they are meeting in a chaotic and broken way. That needs to be reformed, as well as a bunch of other things. I mean, the immigration system is very bureaucratic and complicated. In fact, our broken legal immigration system is one of the leading contributors to illegal immigration. Over 40 percent of the people in this country illegally today came legally. They didn't jump a fence. They didn't sneak in. They came on some sort of temporary visa and they overstayed it. And one of the leading reasons why they overstay is they think it's too costly, too time consuming, and too bureaucratic to come back again legally in the future. So I guess my point is, even if we didn't have a single illegal immigrant in the U.S., we need to do immigration reform because we must modernize our legal immigration system and it must reflect the 21st century. The second point that I would make to you is our immigration laws are only as good as our ability to enforce them. And we don't have enforcement mechanisms that work. All the attention is paid to the border, and it should be, because the border is not just an immigration issue, it is a national security issue. That means the same routes that are used to smuggle in immigrants can be used to smuggle in weapons and terrorists and other things, and drugs. So we must secure the border. And that's not easy to do because there is no such thing as one border. The border is broken up into about nine different sectors. Some are doing much better than they ever have. Others are not doing very well at all. We must secure the border of the United States for national security reasons as well as immigration reasons. And I know that it's hard to do it. And I know there's been efforts in the past that have failed. But I'm telling you that I refuse to accept the idea that the most powerful country on Earth, the nation that put a man on the moon, is incapable of securing its own border. Our sovereignty is at stake in terms of border security. Border security is not an anti-immigration or an anti-immigrant measure. It is an important national security measure, but it is also an important defense of our sovereignty. And we must protect our borders. 
Likewise, we have to understand that even if you protect your borders, the magnet that's bringing people to the United States is employment. And so we have to create a system, which we are capable of doing in the 21st century. We must create a system that allows employers to verify that the person that they are hiring is legally here. Hence all this talk of E-Verify. And last but not least, because 40% of the people that are here illegally entered legally, we have to have a system that tracks when, when visitors enter and when they leave. Now, my colleagues will tell you that's already required by law, and it is. The problem is that the way it's required right now will never work. And that's why this bill deals with that. We have to have a system so when you're visiting the United States on a temporary visa, as a tourist, on business, what it may be, we track you, you log in when you come in, and you log in when you leave. Every hotel in America knows when their guests come in and when they leave. Every hotel in America knows that. Multiple businesses track people when they come in and when they leave. We do this every single day as a matter of routine in our lives. The federal government should be able to do that, and it must do that. And this bill requires that they do that. And it creates a real incentive to do that, and I'll talk about it in a moment. But basically, the incentive is that the green card process for those who are illegally in this country, that doesn't start until that system is fully in place. By the way, it also doesn't start until E-Verify is fully in place. These are significant security measures that we must undertake. When you hear people say, well, the bill weakens the status quo and the law, the problem is that the status quo isn't working. There's a reason why we have 11 million people here illegally, and it's because the status quo, the current law, there's a flaw in it. There's a flaw in E-Verify. The flaw in E-Verify is you basically show up at your employer, you show them a social security card. It may not be your social security card, but that's all you have to show them. It's happening all the time. People are either falsifying the document or borrowing someone else's, and they're using someone else's legal documentation to find a job. We have to create a new E-Verify, one that allows us to verify that the person holding that card is actually that person. Otherwise, arguing in favor of the status quo is arguing in favor of continuing the fraud. So we've got to stop that from happening. So we have to have security elements as part of this bill. Border security, E-Verify, and entry-exit tracking. The last issue, and it's the one that gets all the attention, is what to do with the people that are here illegally now. And let me begin by saying to you that I don't know anyone who's happy about the fact that we have approximately 10.5 to 11 million human beings living in the United States illegally. I would also remind you that every one of their stories is different. And I would caution people not to lump them all into one basket because they're all very different. Some came legally and overstayed. Others entered illegally and have been here ever since. Some came in as very young children, didn't even know they're illegal until they tried to go to college. The point is there's real diversity in that group of people. So we have three options. Option number one is we can ignore it, leave it the way it is, pretend it's not there. And I think if this bill fails or efforts like it fail, that's exactly what we'll have. And for those who oppose amnesty, I would tell you that is de facto amnesty. De facto amnesty is having 11 million people living among you illegally. The only consequence to it is they don't have documentation. But obviously they're working somewhere because they're providing for their families. They don't qualify for any federal benefits. They're all around us everywhere you look whether you know it or not, they're here. Most have been here for longer than a decade. We can ignore it, but if we do, if we leave it in place, if we do nothing, if we do nothing, if this bill fails and we do nothing, that's de facto amnesty. The second option is we can make life miserable on them. We can, we can basically put E-Verify in place, continue to secure the borders, and make life so tough on people that they'll just leave on their own. I don't think that's a practical approach. I don't think it works. I don't think most Americans would tolerate what we would have to do in order for that to happen. I don't think most Americans would tolerate the humanitarian costs of approaching it that way. And at the end of the day, I still think many won't leave anyway. They'll figure out a way to survive and endure.